Rocketing house prices saved many a developer's bacon over the years. Whatever their mistakes, they were still protected by a rising market. But then in August 2007, that protection went away, just as 14 amateur developers set out to turn bricks and mortar into cold, hard cash. We now have about six times as much unsecured credit as we did in the early 90s. The market sort of just plummeting and then you're left with all this sort of negative equity and that is just pretty frightening. When you've put so much love and attention into a property to someone to say, yeah, it's fantastic, but I'm only going to offer you so much. I was worried. I didn't know whether I'd actually made a mistake in, in buying a property at that time. It's autumn 2007, and though the housing market is unstable, there's still much worse to come. So for tonight's developers, taking on two long and complicated niche projects could be a very risky strategy. Did you just think, do you know what, I really need a jailhouse? We paid £71,000 for a lock-up store down a dodgy alley. I'm sure I dream of a door going ka -chunk. October 2007, and house prices have yet to turn in the resort town of Broadstairs on the Kent coast, which is lucky for architectural designer Neil Hornsey and partner Alison Gurr, as they're about to take on the challenge of a lifetime. Off a side street, down a back alley, they've just bought this ugly mishmash of derelict storerooms. Yes, this is the front door. They hope this dark, dirty and totally uninhabitable property is the start of a new career as property developers. From the common eye, it just looks like a storage building full of pigeon poo. We're going to add something that's part of me, part of you, and it's going to really lift it. It's going to feel like it's a, a great pad in the West End of London, right in the heart of Broadstairs. Broadstairs is a popular coastal resort where second homes go for a premium. And despite first impressions, I think these old storerooms could have potential. Only Neil and Alison will have to be very, very clever to unlock it. You've chosen to buy your first development in a street where you've got a pub with live music and a fishmonger's on the left-hand side and then your development is down this little alleyway next door. Yes. The reality is some people might yes. find that noisy and smelly. They may do, but I think you'll find a lot of people that come to Broadstairs are coming here for the atmosphere of everything else. This is a beautiful location. Neil and Alison bought well, paying a bargain £71,000 for the property. They hope their budget of just £65,500 is enough to create a home worth £180,000 price tag. That would bring them a great £43,500 profit for seven months' work. There's a bit of me that thinks that £71,000 is uh, amazing. You can buy a property for that little nowadays. And there's a bit of me that thinks you paid £71,000 for a lock-up store in the back of a shop down a dodgy alley which is quite a lot of money when you look at it in those ways. Yeah, it is. Who's in charge here? Who ultimately is going to make the decisions? We play off well off each other. Um, Neil's very much enthusiastic about the architecture and I can sometimes say, hang on a minute, hang on a minute, we've got to look at the budget. So, um, so the hopefully we'll be able to work well. And uh... So the dynamics here, we've got Airy Fairy designer yeah. and, uh, and money, money man here. <laughs> I really hope Neil and Alison are a good team because solving this property's problems on their tiny £65,000 budget will take a serious balancing act. Now, you don't have any of these parking spaces, is that right? There's actually three properties here and it's a first-come, first-served basis, just shared. <laughs> Got to get in there first. Get in there first, yeah. Have you thought about talking to the, the freeholder about actually buying one of the parking spaces? We are talking to solicitors at the moment. We're hoping that we can try and secure that land for our property and just give the other tenants um, rights of way. 
think the whole development could turn on securing this parking area. Crucially, it would allow them to gate off the approach, turning it from a dingy back alley into an exclusive bolt hole. You also have quite a challenge in turning the back of a shop, effectively, into a contemporary and an exciting residence. How are you planning on achieving that? I think by just changing the look of this space, really modernising this, adding really good quality materials. Glass is going to allow us to sort of just punch all these hard surfaces with light. It's going to open up the internal space and make it bright. The store came with a single bedroom and bathroom upstairs. Neil and Alison want to extend this area over the roof and create a large second bedroom with spectacular windows that should appeal to design-savvy professionals. Downstairs, though, is less successful. There's the main storeroom with a small bathroom to the side, and they want to knock this through and add designer stairs, utility and WC, leaving a large open-plan living space dominated by the kitchen, and that could be a problem. The disadvantage is that you come through the front door and the first thing you come into is the kitchen. If this is a living area, you're either going to be sitting next to the staircase or next to the toilet and utility room. So you think walking straight into the kitchen is the When you've got an open plan space, you have to walk into one of those spaces. Absolutely, but in an ideal world, I think you'd walk into the, the living area and the kitchen is in an area that isn't in direct view all the time. With open plan areas, where you position the kitchen is all important. Here, I put it round the corner into the recessed area, keeping an open feel, but also offering just enough shielding for the best of both worlds. We need to look at how we, like, where we put that kitchen. So you uh, might put it in there, yeah? We might not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Right. The last thing this complicated development needs is an awkward layout. Alison and Neil have enough on their hands already getting people through the front door. 130 miles away in Norfolk's historic town of Thetford, house sales are starting to dwindle, which is not good news for former welfare officer Sue Ward. She's hoping this Grade II listed Georgian jail, complete with cells, original doors and even a filled-in dungeon, will provide her with a new career. I think I've got an artistic eye, I've got a vision for this property and I'm confident that it's going to turn out the way I want it to. The jail has been a rundown rental for the last five years, but Sue's convinced she can draw on the original character to transform it into a desirable two-bedroom home. The danger is it's going to appeal to a very niche market. When you saw jailhouse for sale, did you just think, do you know what, I really need a jailhouse, or did it kind of evolve? When I walked into it, I fell in love with it. It just had those quirky features that I thought would be, uh, would be a selling point. So you'd have been locked into the cell, and, uh, and this is where you'd have got your food. And actually, the only light coming in would have been through that aperture there. I'm sure I'd dream of the door going ka chunk. We <laughs> get help, help, help. <laughs> Obviously, it has that effect on some people, but I'm hoping I'm not on too many people. My worry is that it will. Taking on a property with such a gruesome history is ringing its serious alarm bells, as does Sue's figures. She paid £140,000 for it a year ago when the market was in a different universe. She's planning to do most of the work herself in an attempt to keep to an unfeasibly small £20,000 budget. And she hopes to sell for £200,000, bringing in a £40,000 profit. It's not a lot of money for refurbishing a big old building like this. I can't afford for it to go too much over budget because that would leave us with no profit at all. I mean, I, I would expect it to be maybe 60,000. Well, I'm hoping not. I'm very good at bargain hunting. Are you? <laughs> um, I'm very good at negotiation, and uh, I'm going to do a lot of the work myself. But I do think the margins are quite tight on this as a house. 
I mean, you do face a real possibility that you won't make as much money as you think you might. This is a massive restoration project with a full team of builders I'd expected to take around four months. But flying solo, I think she could be imprisoned here for a very long time indeed. Developers are looking to beat the market by taking on problem properties. It's a high-risk strategy that can land first-timers in very hot water. In Thetford, Sue Ward has given up her career to single-handedly transform this spooky jail into a two-bedroomed home. It's October 2007, and nervousness in the mortgage market means house sales have already stalled. We're not quite sure yet, but um, from what people have said to me, they think the dungeon is under here. So um, once the floorboards are, are lifted up, we might actually find, if we're lucky, the original trap door and the ladder. Oh, let me be there on that day. <laughs> if you've got your shovel. <laughs> well, that's a deal, that's a deal. God, how exciting. What do you think we'll find? It might be treasure. Failing that, it could add some valuable storage space. The serious business, though, is above ground, and Sue's plans have me a little worried. Spread over two floors, upstairs are two bedrooms, a bathroom and a large landing. Downstairs is a living room, study and kitchen, with a single-storey outhouse behind that. Apart from a total refurb, Sue wants to rebuild the outhouse, installing a utility and large dining room that will be knocked through to the existing kitchen. In all, it will be a large two-bedroom house aimed at a small family or retired couple. And there's the rub. It's adventurous first-time buyers who are much more likely to go for such an unusual property. Had you thought about turning it into flats, this? Not really. I know that in this area there is a demand for flats and there's a flat next door that sold for mm. over 130,000. Now, that's a one-bedroom flat. So if you had two one-bedroom flats here, you're talking about 260, and I think it would divide. That's a whole £60,000 more than Sue's target sale. I think as soon as you start carving up historical buildings, I think you lose some of that... Uh, um, appearance. That may not be such a bad thing. Downstairs would only need a small rejig to include a bedroom and bathroom. While upstairs you could turn the larger bedroom into an open plan kitchen living room and bring the huge landing into the living space for the upstairs apartment. The rest of the original jail has already been converted into smaller units. Personally, I think keeping it consistent to the remainder of the building is also crucial to its saleability. That wouldn't be my preference. Why not? <laughs> I just think it will make a superb house. Do you need to make money on this? Is it important to make money on this? Yes. With this building, if you actually want to make the most possible profit on it, that probably is turning it into two flats. From an aesthetic point of view, I would be loathed to turn it into flats. OK, so it's a house not two flats. It yeah. is a house. Knowing the market is a basic rule of developing and you have to get the basics right to succeed in today's difficult conditions. In Broadstairs, Neil Hornsey and Alison Gurr are starting their own massively challenging project. They're hoping to transform this derelict store into a luxury two-bed holiday home. The builders kick off by knocking through the whole ground floor in line with Sue and Neil's open plan design. It's just a fabulous building in the heart of Broadstairs, which just happens to be near a pub and near a fishmonger's. Once we get people inside the building, it's just going to be a wow after wow after wow. Unfortunately, getting buyers into the property is where it falls down. Its situation is pretty off-putting and the locals seem to share my view. It's up an alleyway and it really doesn't look attractive at all. I wouldn't want to live next door to a fishmonger. They do have live bands in this pub as well and it is going to be quite noisy. There is a solution and that's if Neil and Alison buy the freehold to the alley. 
This London property is also off a busy road and down a narrow lane, but the approach has been turned into an exclusive enclave. With this development here, they've moved the entrance right up onto the road, which means that as soon as you come off the road, you're already in the development and you already have a sense of privacy. The downside of your development is the fact that you've got the pub, you've got the fishmonger, you've got the alleyway, and whichever way you look at it is always going to hold it back. But you have the ability of being able to change that by putting gates at, right up by the road. With good design, Alison and Neil could turn their alley from a major minus to a huge plus. Here, steel siding, an understated water feature and clever lighting all combine to stunning effect. Yeah, I, I like the idea of it because what we have is we're going for a very high-end dwelling. But at the moment we can't do that because we can't, we don't own that space. I think that of top priority should be pursuing the freeholder to either buy the freehold or ask their permission to put the gates in and pursuing the other tenants who use the alleyway to get their agreement to put the gates in, even if they don't contribute financially towards them. We've established who the freeholder is, but we've just got to sort of focus our attention on sort of talking further. It'll cost a few thousand pounds putting gates up, but it's money definitely worth spending and you should certainly pursue it to the bitter end. 146 miles away in Thetford, Sue Ward's six-month jailhouse project is also underway. And to say her approach is a more hands-on one is a major understatement. She's gutting the entire property herself. And while you have to admire this huge effort, in this housing market, not hiring in help could be a major false economy. I've got a little bit behind with some aspects of the build. Sometimes it'd be nice to get uh, people in to help a bit more, but the budget is really tight, so I'm going to have to plod on and do as much as I can myself. And there's another huge worry hanging over this development. I'm still not convinced it's the best solution to develop this jail into a two-bedroom house. Yes! I think downstairs would sell as a flat, but upstairs there just isn't the space. And I think, frankly, it would be criminal. This is a beautiful building, and I think it will sell much better as a house. When you're developing, it's crucial to know your local market. But I'm not sure Sue's done her homework, because here, unlike much of the country, where there's an oversupply of flats, they are still good business. And I'm not the only one to spot this. This site a few yards away is earmarked for 24 apartments. Just down the road, though, the developer has been trying to sell both flats and houses off plan. This development here is 12 flats and eight houses. They've sold eight flats and only four houses. The flats are flying out the door. But the houses aren't, and that tells its own story. The splitting of my unit into two flats will be clumsy. Downstairs flat will be great. Definitely not the upstairs one. I think the upstairs one is a real problem. As it stands, Sue's looking for a £200,000 resale, but that would be for her entire house. So how much could two apartments fetch in Sue's property? This area here would be very similar to the space you'd have on the upstairs flat. How much do you think this is on the market for? I would have expected it to be on just under the 100000 mark. This is on the market for £125,000, and it's just fractionally more square footage than you would have on your first floor flat. Sue's downstairs area would create an even larger flat fetching around £10,000 more. Together, they could add £60,000 to her target sale price. I know you've shown me this flat, um, but the layout within the jailhouse, I think upstairs, will be cramped. Is there an element of truth in the fact that you've sort of fallen in love with the jailhouse and that actually you're, you're veering off the path of the fact that this is for a business and, as the bottom line, it's about money? I think the building has a charm about it and I think there'll be people who are similarly interested and will buy it because of that. I think you're going to keep it as a house, aren't you? I am. I think that's the bottom line, I'm afraid. Sue's given up her job and her savings. Is she in danger of giving up her future too? In Broadstairs, Neil and Alison are progressing well in their development. And there's big news. The owner of the alley is willing to sell them the freehold for £10,000. But unbelievably, they're balking at the price. Instead, they're shelling out major money on building a brand new first floor 
that many would-be buyers may never make it up the alley to see. You do take risks when you're borrowing the amount of money that we're borrowing to do this. And, yeah, you do wake up with those cold sweats some mornings and think, crikey, that's a lot of money. But hopefully we'll be selling up quickly once we've completed it and we'll uh, be making the, making the profit. With the shabby alley, that's far from a sure thing. What is certain is the rest of the development now has to be faultless. I can see kitchen units coming down here and an island here. Neil and Alison want a central kitchen that will dominate the living space. That may be a big mistake. Buyers are likely to want it against the far wall in the more secluded and recessed area. This two million pound London property has a very similar L-shaped ground floor and here the layout feels spot on. Here they've got the perfect solution because the kitchen is tucked right around the corner so whilst you can socialise with a person who's cooking, because you can, you can chop and you can chat to the people who are sitting here, it also means that you can sit in the, on the sofa and not have to look at all the pots and pans and the mess that you've made. You can just mm. shust away. And what we've done is we've looked at the kitchens in all locations and I think we came up with a decision where we felt it was less compromised I, mean, I think it's important not to lose sight of who's actually going to live in this house. And your market is probably a second home owner. So the first thing that someone's going to want to do when they turn up to this house is relax. And, and so relaxing should be the focal point of the house and not cooking. Hmm. You're right, actually, in refocusing on who are we selling it to. Mm, That's what we've yeah. got to keep coming okay. back to because what happens we get we personal. Went off the boil with that one, didn't we? we get personal and we start thinking this is the way that we would live. In Thetford, Sue has been a lot less interested in suggestions. She's keeping the jail as a house, although she's given in to getting a bit of help. By and large, she's doing the work herself. Progress is painfully slow. She only just started boarding out the main house, and most of the work is still ahead. The extension hasn't started yet because I'm really concentrating on the main house first. I think it's very, very easy to get distracted and go to another area of the development and then really you get nothing completed. It's another two months before she begins clearing the extension area. Dismantling the outhouse brick by brick by brick. You're now five and a half months into the project and you were hoping that this would be finished in six months. Do you have a schedule of works? Do you know I, how long it's I, going to take? I don't know how long it's going to take. I have a schedule. I think the way my schedule is working is that I, I have a list of uh, all the jobs that need to be done. Um, I tick them off as, as they get done. How long do you reckon it's going to be before you, the house is finished? It will be finished in six months. Six months. Obviously, one of the main issues is that you're doing a lot of this yourself. I mean, I could have got people in from day one and had huge numbers of workmen on site, but um, my budget would not stretch to it. And I think I said to you right at the very beginning, I am going to bring it in on budget, and uh, that involves doing a lot of the work myself. Yeah. Sue's so concerned with the budget, she's forgotten the market. It's March 2008, and in the five months since she started, House sales have dropped nearly 50% in the area. With every passing day, Sue is losing money. See, I think you could finish this in six to eight weeks if you actually shifted on it. I'm certainly up for um, making uh, a schedule and uh, perhaps uh, speeding it up a bit. What would you be prepared to try and commit to? Try and commit, I say Three try. months. Three months, 12, 12 weeks. weeks. Yes, I'll give it my best shot. I set your challenge. <laughs> <laughs> Sue rises to my challenge. She draws up a new schedule and sets about clearing the old dungeon and hires in two labourers to help. But I have to give Sue her due. She does lead from the front. It is really exhilarating being down here but I can't begin to explain what hard work this is. If Sue carries on like this, who knows she might even make the 12-week deadline. In Broadstairs, Neil and Alison are halfway through their six-month build, and unlike Sue, they're exactly on schedule. But that 
could all be about to change. It's a very simple space that we're developing and it really does need this, this signature piece. Neil's shopping for stairs, but it was always going to be hard to combine his design ambitions with Alison's cost keeping. How much did this one cost then? This will cost you, I think it's about 100,000. In Broadstairs, Neil Hornsey and Alison Gurr are halfway through their schedule. The build's going well, but spending here is a big issue. 10 grand could secure them the freehold of the alley and an exclusive gated development. Designer Neil thinks the money would be better spent elsewhere. Neil's twisted my arm to up the budget from £4,000 to actually £20,000 for the stairs to achieve the look that he wants. He has had to work extremely hard to get me on side with this one because at the end of the day he's asking us to spend a third of the budget, of the total budget, just on stairs. For £20,000, I think Neil and Sue could afford both the alley and their stairs. I agree a cutting-edge open-plan house needs a great staircase, but good developing is about creating maximum impact without breaking the bank. I think you should set yourself a £10,000 top whack budget for the staircase because I don't think by spending any more than £10,000 you're going to make more when you come to sell it. It'll just be money down the drain. Yeah, I'm pleased with anything you say to persuade Neil to reduce the budget, to be honest. So, <laughs> um, halving it sounds like a good idea, even though it's still double what we originally planned on spending. I want Neil and Alison to see this fabulous curved staircase that could also hit my £10,000 budget. The secret is in the materials. You can create a truly beautiful staircase which will stand the test of time out of wood and it would cost an awful lot less quite honestly so have that as your feature rather than 20,000 pounds of glass treads I think the decision you have to make is is this a development or is this just a design showpiece yes this is a development that I want to do and I want to make money out of it and you're right I think we can achieve something absolutely fantastic for this challenge that you'll give me a £10,000, <laughs> then I'll work to that and I'll show you something absolutely brilliant at the end of it. In Thetford, Sue's solo progress is continuing at a snail's pace. I was hoping she would have finished it by now, but three months on and the walls of the new extension are only just going up. I've uh, sort of asked friends and family to help build this extension rather than pay out for brick layers. So uh, budget is looking healthy, schedule is not what I agreed it would be. Religiously sticking to her budget is one thing, but it makes no sense when it results in extending the schedule in a falling market. Well, not a perfect cut. <laughs> What's more, Sue's passion with restoring the jail's character I think is taking her away from the important work on site. She's making a 600 mile round trip to Dartmoor to buy a cell door for the upstairs bedroom. Putting another jail door I think will just uh, enhance the building and bring it back to its former glory. There you go. That will keep the governor happy. I'm not sure Sue should be spending money on making her property even more jail-like. Personally, I'd be concentrating on warming up the cold original character with clever design. There's a trick or two to be learned from this old prison in Oxford that's recently been converted into a hotel. Well, most of it anyway. This is clearly what you want to try and not achieve because <laughs> <laughs> this is the original cell. Acoustically, it's really quite unpleasant to be in and it feels very small. I mean, it is a jail, it is a cell, and you know it when you're in it. Mm -hmm. Developments need to attract as many buyers as possible. With Sue's property, that's a bigger challenge than usual. They've used the light colour on the walls, but it's a warm and thick, rich colour, so although it brightens it, it's not cold. And they've used darker colours on the bedspread and the furniture to sort of embrace the fact it is a, a small dark room, but without making it feel claustrophobic, mm. and that's quite a fine art to have achieved that. It's a lovely combination, yes. They've also rendered two of the walls so that they're smooth rendered and softer mm. than having brick all the way around. 
ceiling panels and carpeted floors are a good device to eliminate any eerie echo. It's all intended to take the hard edges off the original building. You've driven down to Dartmoor, haven't you, to pick up a, a cell door mm -hmm. to use in the house? Mm -hmm. It's to go on the ensuite. That was an area that would have been a cell originally, which is why I've got that door, just to embrace what would have been in that area. But I think if you've got a very small room that's very constricted and an original uh, cell door, I, I think that there are some people who may find that a little bit um, well, claustrophobic, really. Well, you'll have to use the ensuite and see how you feel when it's finished. <laughs> no, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> In complete contrast, in Broadstairs, Neil and Alison's design ideas are spot on for their developing market. An ultra-modern kitchen is being installed in the ground floor's recessed area. And Neil's stairs are going up, with thankfully not one piece of expensive glass in sight. It should be an exciting time, but Neil and Alison are worried. It's April 2008 and a tumbling nationwide property market is prompting a major rethink. We've got new plans for the property. We decided to uh, hold on to it as a holiday let. The market is very unstable and um, there's a lot of media hype about prices going down and a recession. Uh, so we think that ultimately now is not a good time to sell. It's a huge decision and I want to make sure Neil and Alison have really thought it through. I understand why you're thinking as you are because it, it, it's a dilemma that I think a lot of people are in. But I think you have to look at the reality of the situation right now. Whatever you read in the papers or are told by agents, the only true way to gauge prices in today's uncertain market is to look on the Land Registry website. Here in Broadstairs, prices are still static. So I'm not sure that letting instead of selling is such a good move. There is a massive difference between developing a property to sell and developing a property as a holiday let. And surely it's tremendously over-specified for a holiday let. It will warrant, I think, as a holiday let, a more discerning client that's going to come down and let and, and use it. And most people who come here are families yeah, yeah. and they have kids and that's not a very good holiday let for a family with kids. Whether we sell it or whether it's a holiday let it's always been designed around a young professional couple. I personally think it's going to be easier to find somebody who's prepared to buy a home who's a young professional than lots and lots of young professionals who want to come to Broadstairs on a week's holiday and rent somewhere. Perhaps we're getting a bit greedy. Perhaps we're falling into that camp to think, hmm, we want a bit more. Shall I cash my chips in now? In Thetford, it's now been over a year since Sue started on the jail and her prison sentence seems never-ending. There's still a huge amount of work to be done, connecting the extension to the house. And then on top of that, at Sue's pace, many more weeks of plastering and decorating ahead. They're still not finished. You could say that. <laughs> not, far, not far off now, though. No, because it's 18 months since you started, isn't yes. it? And you were going to take six months. Yes. And when we met after six months, you said, 12 weeks definitely will be finished. It's, it's a long way from being finished, isn't it? So the six-month schedule at the beginning, I, I see now, was totally unrealistic. But then I had no experience. I had no frame of reference. Uh, it was my first renovation. I want to see inside. Follow me. With buyers few and far between, I worry that even when Sue does finish this development, those quirky prison features have made this even more difficult to sell. It actually literally is a dungeon. Wow. There's a lot of jail references in this, isn't there, which is fine. And well, that's I think what it is, a That's jail. what it is. And I think, ultimately, you're either going to love this building or hate it, aren't you? I think that there is a huge interest now in unusual buildings. I think people are looking for something more than the standard box, and I think this is more, uh, more than a sort of a standard box. It's just all a bit creepy being in a dungeon with some shackles, but maybe that's because I've got an issue with being locked up in a dungeon. <laughs> <laughs> the truth is, this development has missed a bit of an opportunity from the beginning. Turning the house into flats could have been Sue's get-out-of-jail-free card 
but I feel that she's been too close to the development to see its true potential. I think the truth is you've committed the cardinal sin of property developing and you fell in love with this development, didn't you? You could say I have an attachment to this building. That would be fair to say. <laughs> and, and more and more as it, it moved on, it stopped being a development and it became a historical restoration and a labour of love. I think it has turned into a restoration. I, I never wanted to be out of pocket. I always wanted there to be, um, you know, a, a profit from it. But obviously in this current market, I doubt that I've even got that now. Do you know how much it's, it's worth now? I think I have a rough idea. In this present market, mm -hmm. I think it's probably only worth about 155. That's 50,000 pounds less than she hoped for. Even with a never-ending schedule, it's important to keep an eye on the market to see if you've lost all chance of making a profit. It's got lots of period features and it's full of character. Unfortunately, since the owners have bought this property, house prices in the area have dropped about 20%. I would value this property at 160,000 pounds. I value this property at £160,000. So what's the plan? Because you're, it's now valued at about break-even point mm -hmm. for you. Mm -hmm. What are you thinking you're going to do? I've taken the decision to, um, to, to develop it into um, a holiday uh, let. Goodness, holiday let. It's a good idea, but I think that you have to be aware in this market, you need a 10-year plan, not a one- or two-year plan if you're going to do this as a holiday let. Well, hopefully your holiday letting career will, will be more enjoyable and, and better than your developing career. Watch out, I've still got the shackles down in the dungeon, <laughs> so don't be nasty. Oh <laughs> Back in Broadstairs, Neil and Alison are really motoring and coming to the end of their development. And thankfully, they've decided against doing a holiday let, so they're going to sell. Not put off by the falling market, they're hoping for even more than their original £180,000 target price. I would expect it to be up between somewhere between 230 to 245 We're going to get a certain type of person who's going to want to come and buy this because of its architectural merit. <laughs> Since Neil and Alison Gurr started out on their massive conversion of an old lock-up in Broadstairs in Kent, Northern Rock has collapsed, mortgage approvals have plummeted and no-one's got a clue when and if the housing market will recover. If we don't make the profit, then we're, I could be in a little, little bit of trouble with Alison. But if anything is going to beat the market, this development must be very close. In Broadstairs, six months after they started, Neil and Alison's development is finished. Bang on schedule. And what they've done with the outside of this old storeroom is really quite remarkable. Big feature windows and a front decked area signpost this as a modern high-spec home. The trouble is that it's in direct contrast with the alley leading to it. An alley that could have been Neil and Alison's for just £10,000. Once you take £10,000 and in the cost of putting a gate across here, we're probably talking around about £20,000 and it just didn't stack up. I think I disagree with that. I mean, you should be able to put electric gates in and a couple of intercom systems for, for £5,000. So it would be a total of £15,000. Well, I really wouldn't want to pay more than £5,000. Um, if this was my development, I would want to have this alleyway so that I could transform it. But you finish the development now and presumably you want to get it on the market and just get on. Yeah. And that's a shame because inside this home is really quite fantastic. The derelict old building is now a temple of high design with a great finish, super clean lines and lime green feature walls all working together in a superb open plan space. Not least because the kitchen is exactly where it should be. Overall, do you think that this space now works well downstairs? This worked out best because it gave us the best use of the space for the open plan area to sit and dine. So you're relieved you didn't end up putting the kitchen slap bang in front of you as you walked through the door? Yeah. No, yes. 
<laughs> I was going to say, I was going to say no. I'm pleased we didn't put the kitchen over there. Really, for the reason now is that when you come through the door, you see my fantastic staircase. It still needs a handrail, but the paired back steel and wood construction is starkly simple, and I think quite stunning. Did Neil rise to the challenge and halve the £20,000 he originally thought he had to spend? So how much did they end up costing you? It cost us £8,500. Right, so you did manage to halve the cost from 20000 down. Yeah, we saved ourselves thousands of pounds by actually using my skill of being able to design. It's great that he's managed to meet your challenge to, to bring it under 10000 because £20,000 was just a ridiculous figure for a staircase. Upstairs, Neil and Alison have gone for a simpler look in the master bedroom. The huge windows make enough of a statement on their own. Next door, the luxury kicks in with a top-end bathroom. A mosaic wall and the sleekest of fittings combined again for the very highest finish. It all looks great, but it all looks very expensive. And initially you were hoping to spend 65500 on the whole development. How much did you end up spending? A little bit more. <laughs> um, we actually ended up spending £90,000. So do you think your budget was unrealistic in the first place? No, I don't think it was, because I think I could have turned this development round for the 65500 But we could see the potential once we started to get the second floor in. So we upped our game in certain aspects. So it changed along the way, and, yeah. and you didn't quite sort of appreciate exactly what you bought until further on down the line. Yeah. I kind of think once you bought this space, this was your only option. You had to go down this line and it was always going to cost this sort of figure. It would have been a big problem if you'd bought this slightly dodgy space and a slightly dodgy alleyway and kept it all right. Doing this whole project for £90,000 is pretty impressive, but it does mean if Neil and Alison sell at their original target price of £180,000, they'd be well under the £43,000 profit they were hoping for. That would now make you a £19,000 profit. Would that be OK? £19,000 isn't bad, but I don't think it would be worth £180,000. I think it's going to be in excess of £200,000. What do you think it could be worth now? In our wildest dreams, it would be an absolute amazing dream to come true if we got around 245 but there's always the danger of getting greedy. Yeah, I'd, I'd be happy at the sort of the 230 mark. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd be happy, I'd be over the moon if we sort of hit those sort of figures. That's a whole £50,000 over the original £180,000 target. Will the agents think Neil and Alison have done enough? I really like the idea of the, uh, the kitchen being tucked away a bit uh, so it doesn't become a focal point. The staircase is stylish in its own right. It's a perfect kind of weekend retreat or possibly a bolt hole for someone. I think it will definitely attract uh, an out-of-town buyer. I do have some reservations about the location. Uh, at the end of the day, a beautiful house uh, next door to a fishmonger. We would be looking to achieve a sale price of £210,000. I would value this property at £225,000. I would value this property at £225,000. Now, we've had three valuations and they've come in at 210000 225000 and 225000 I think that's fantastic. They would give you a profit of between forty nine and £64,000. You only need to find that one-off buyer because that's all it will take, but that may be a bit tricky. It's a bit of a one-off property. In. So do you have an idea what you'll put it on the market for? I think it would make sense to market it around about the 230 mark. If I was yard going at 220, ultimately you want to generate interest in this, don't you? You want lots of people to want to come and look at it. Yeah, I think you might be right. And if you've got five people who want to buy it, it'll end up at 230. Yeah. OK. I think we'll go for 220. Yeah, I think we'll put it up on the market for 220. And, OK. Uh, Good luck. Good yeah. luck with it. Thank you. Neil and Alison put their house on the market for £225,000 and four months later accept an offer of £210,000, making them a respectable £49,000 profit. Property developing is a risky business even when the market's on your side. 
If you've got a good business plan and a strong set of figures, it is possible to make a profit even in a falling market. If it's a hobby, though, steer well clear. It could cost you dear. Next week's developers prospered in a rising market. Two new business, holiday lets and property development. You've bitten off a lot. But now they're risking it all on a huge historic development. It's become our future. The bookings are essential to our survival because everything we've got, we've ploughed into it. 